So my name is Seth Chismore, um, Release Engineering Lead at Chef Software. Uh, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about automating Art Factory through the lens of how we ship software at Chef. Um, so just to get started here, who's Chef Software? So we're the creators and maintainers of many of the open source DevOps tools uh, that you guys probably know, including Chef, Chef Server, Test Kitchen, and Omnibus. Um, we were founded in 2008. It used to be called Ops Code, so you might recognize that name. Uh, about 200 employees and growing fast. And we've got offices in Seattle, San Francisco, London. And who am I? So I was actually employed 20 at Chef. Um, and like I mentioned, I'm release engineering lead. But previously, I worked as an engineer on the Chef server and push jobs products, Sling and Erlang. And I was responsible for a lot of Chef's early Windows support. So I've touched a lot of our stuff. Um, and in the past, I, was, uh, I started my career at IBM and then was at Fox Interactive Media. Um, so we ship a lot of products some of these product names here. Uh, just run through real fast, give you guys an overview of what they are. So we've got the Chef Client, which is sort of what you think of when you think of Chef. It's the uh, agent that runs on every node and manages it. Uh, Chef DK is our set of workstation tools. So this is uh, got the stuff that you would interact with your Chef infrastructure with and has things for test-driven development. The servers, the hub, that's sort of where all the cookbooks are stored. Policies are applied to nodes from that. Metadata about each of the nodes Chef manages. And then Chef Deliveries, uh, our continuous delivery product, which was just announced actually at ChefConf a couple weeks back. Um, we have an analytics product, which actually works in conjunction with the Chef server. Um, and it gives visibility, notifications, compliance for any Chef managed infrastructure. Uh, the management console is the web UI. Push jobs, server and client are actually for distributed job dispatch. And they're actually a primitive tool that's used by other things like delivery to actually do things. Supermarkets, the community cookbook repo, which is sort of like rubygems.org or CPAN um, or NPM, any of those kind of things that you, know, you share cookbooks with. And then there's two uh, server add-ons, one for HA uh, for high availability features for the Chef server, and another one for syncing policy data between multiple Chef servers. So think multi-data center stuff here. Um, we also ship across many platforms. So you can see there we've got some AIX, multiple versions of Debian, Enterprise Linux, um, which is CentOS, RHEL, that kind of stuff. We've got FreeBSD, OS 10, multiple versions, Solaris, all the Ubuntu LTSs, which we get to drop 10.04 here very soon. Um, and then multiple versions of Windows. Uh, so the client products are shipped, like in particular Chef Client, shipped across all these platforms. Um, the server products are across EL and Ubuntu. So you can see that's quite a bit there. And then you start adding in mixes of architecture. So we got x86, x86, 64, Spark, and Power. Um, so when you start to try to wrap your head around this matrix formed by the product, platform, art combinations, you start to feel a little bit like this. Um, yeah, your mind starts to blow a little bit. Although, since it's a chef, it probably feels more like this. Um, so as you can imagine, we're pretty big fans of all chefs, including the Swedish variety. Um, so what's the goal? For us, the goal is continuous delivery. We want to ship software continually, we want to ship it safely, and we want to ship it at velocity. Uh, we want to get new features and fixes out into our end users' hands as soon as they are merged. We want to foster an engineering culture that encourages experimentation so they can try ideas out and get them shipped. And we want to build products, a build produced anytime one of our products' dependencies changes, right? So that's what we're working towards. Uh, so this is what I want shipping software at Chef to feel like, peaceful, shady, and apparently a little antebellum. But seriously, I think you get the point. Like Shipping software shouldn't be stressful, right? And that's what we're trying to work to end. Does anyone know where that is, actually? It is in Georgia. That's where I'm from. That's actually uh, the Worms Low Plantation out near Savannah. So it's a pretty, pretty awesome spot. Um, all right, so this is sort of the high-level diagram that shows like what shipping software, sort of our um, pipeline, looks like. And we're going to spend a little time looking at this, because it's going to serve as sort of the map on this journey I'm going to walk you guys through. Um, so we've got the three different systems, which are the green boxes. Uh, we currently use a mix of Jenkins and Chef Delivery for doing CI. So that's the left box there. Um, these systems publish out into our Artifactory Pro instance. And this serves as a system of record for all our builds. Uh, that red dotted line represents the division between uh, internal and external. So everything to the left are internal systems, and everything to the right is external. So as you can see, CI and Artifactory are internal only. So in order for our users to consume builds of our software, we publish out to two external systems to the right side of that dotted line. Uh, we use Package Cloud to serve up apt and yum repos uh, for the platforms that support it. So that'll get us you know, EL, uh, Ubuntu, Debian. 
And for everything else, we have a homegrown solution called OmniTruck. Um, OmniTruck exposes like metadata and download endpoints, and it works in conjunction with an install SH, SH script, which gives you some uh, curl, to, curl to bash functionality, basically. It's secure. We do do validation on all the checksums as things are coming down, stuff like that. So, um, so that's sort of like the systems. Now, the blue boxes represent stages that an artifact flows through. Uh, the build stage up there, um, that's actually, we use Omnibus, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, we use that to compile a deployable package, and then the artifacts generated by the build stage are installed onto all the supported platforms, and an integration test suite is executed against those individual installs. So we collectively call those integration test suites pedant, and if a build passes the pedant testing for all of the supported platforms of that build, we then publish the, th the artifacts out to Artifactory, which is the Omnibus current local repo you see there. So that's when we start to sort of talk about our, our release channels and the stability contract that goes along with each of those. So as you can see, builds pass that pass basic testing will move from CI over into the Omnibus current local repo, and that represents the current channel or system. So anything in the current channel can be thought of as a release candidate for the stable channel. Uh, so it could be promoted up to the stable channel, which is the Omnibus stable local repo. Um, and so the question would be, so when's a build ready for promotion? Uh, that varies by project, but at a high level, there's a predefined set of user acceptance testing, and uh, this UAT might be automated. Some of it might still be manual, and it's really up to each product team to determine if they want to do manual UAT testing versus an automated solution, and we're trying to get everyone towards, obviously, a full automated. Um, and then finally, as you can see, the external systems, um, each has a has a channel that mirrors the associated repo and artifactory, right? So anything that hits the Omnibus current local repo and artifactory goes out to the Chef current channel in the, other, in the external system. So, um, so I don't know if there's like questions about that. I try to do a quick walkthrough of it, and we're going to zoom in like on each of these boxes and sort of talk about things in detail. So, um, so a couple other facts real quick about our infrastructure. 100% of our release infrastructure is managed by Chef. So we believe in dog fooding pretty heavily. Uh, it provides an extra layer of testing, and it forces us to endure what might be a really bad product UX and forces us to want to change the product. Um, in the near future, we're going to be automatically updating the Chef version out on all that release infrastructure to the latest build from current, the current channel. Um, and this auto update will occur at a minimum like once a day. And then our release infrastructure currently is mostly on EC2, uh, minus some obvious platforms, the like AX, OS 10, stuff that won't run on EC2. And we're actually moving to ephemeral CI nodes later this year. That's one of the goals for this summer. So we want to do that because we want to spend less money, obviously. We want to just bring the slaves up when we need them. We want to guarantee a clean and build test environment for each job. And we want to support concurrent builds of the same product. And also, when builds are running, we'll be able to use larger instances, which means faster builds and tests, makes happy developers. Cool. So first thing we're going to zoom in on is talk about the, the build stage here. Um, I know this doesn't have a whole lot to do with Artifactory, but it, there's some important pieces that happen at Artifact creation that are going to affect later stages I want to make sure you guys are aware of. Um, so I mentioned we use something called Omnibus for doing our build. So it's a Ruby framework for creating full stack installable artifacts. Uh, the final artifact is, uh, contains the prox code, everything else, all the dependencies. And it supports all platforms we ship Chef on. So you can see it's got support for Linux, Solaris, Windows, like everything. So, um, and it's completely open source, so anybody can actually use this framework to do full stack builds. Um, and I know the first thought is probably, wow, that seems like overkill to be packaging you know, the thing and all its dependencies, uh, like Ruby or OpenSSL. But, and that's definitely right, I think, for simple projects that maybe ship on a platform or two. But imagine when you want to keep a certain version of Ruby in sync across like all versions of that platform. And then better yet, now add in other platforms, with, which some are really old, like Solaris 10. Um, and you also don't want to be limited by the libraries and components you can ship in the application stack just based on what, what there's official distro packages for. So, um, so I want to just give a quick view of what it looks like, right? So this is a project definition. There's a simple DSL you would define the project with. You can see at the top there, got a name. So this is actually Chef Server's project def definition. It's got a build version, and then there's a list of dependencies. Um, and we're going to zoom into one of those dependencies and sort of see 
So we're going to talk about Postgres 9.2, and you can sort of see what a software definition looks like. Um, so here's a software definition. Important things to note, there's a name and source. So we got URL and checksums. Um, software definitions can have their own set of dependencies, right? So these become transitive dependencies for the project. And Omnibus is really smart. It automatically computes uh, which component needs to be built first based on the project's full dependency graph. Um, and then obviously you got a series of build steps, right? If you've ever compiled Postgres from source, pretty simple. You got a configure step here, a make world, make install world. Um, and you don't have to just compile from source. You could actually do other things in that software definition. So we actually, on our Windows stuff, a lot of this stuff's been pre-compiled. So we're just assembling the parts at that point. Um, builds are actually just executed via a command line tool. So if we were to build Chef Server, it's just Omnibus build Chef Server. Get some uh, nice log output here. Uh, you know, load, load some configuration. You load that project definition. Lots of compiling, which I didn't put up here. Uh, then we run a health check. Now the health check's really important because we want to ensure the supposedly isolated compiled output isn't linked against any system libraries, right? We want things to be portable, so when somebody else goes to install this package that we produce, it'll just work. And then at the end, we package it up. So Omnibus actually supports uh, multiple packagers out of the box, and the packager is determined by the build platform, right? So this was being built on Ubuntu, so we, we produce a deb. We could have done an RPM, MSIs, Solaris archives, uh, BFF, which is for AIX, and we fall back to make self, which is actually, if anybody's used that, it's a self-extractable archive, basically. Um, cool, so in addition to the binary artifact that's produced by the build, uh, Omnibus also produces a JSON file full of metadata that describes the artifact, right? So you can see it's named in a similar way, except it's just got the .metadata JSON extension on it. Um, take a look at what's in that. We've got four types of checksums, uh, the platform version and architecture that was built, the name, the version, the iteration, right? Really good stuff. Um, and as you're gonna soon find out, this metadata is really useful at later stages of our pipeline. Cool, so now we're gonna zoom over in the middle here and talk about the actual repo layouts uh, we use for these Omnibus artifacts. Um, so the structure is pretty simple. At the top level, we have an org path that's dictated by Artifactory, and then a folder for each of the projects, which if you go back to that list, you'd see a lot of the same projects. Names are slightly different, just for legacy reasons. Um, and then if you drop down into a project folder, subfolder for each version, and then we have a subfolder for each platform and then platform version. Uh, and two artifacts built for the same platform, or same version, platform, platform version, but different architectures can be stored in the same folder since the architecture is just part of the name, so that's safe. Uh, and this is sort of what the layout looks like. It's really hard to show regex on a presentation, but it's nasty, but it does get the job done. You can see some of the paths at the top that end up matching, same structure. Um, and then Omnibus automatically generates uh, and appends a timestamp and optional dit describe data to the artifacts by default. So the presence of that build data is actually how we determine if something should be considered an integration version. And that pattern's much simpler. You can see it's either a timestamp or just the timestamp and some optional get described. And that's just part of the framework. You get that out of the box. Cool, so next we're gonna chat about the Ruby client we've written for Artifactory, and it sort of affects like all of our publishing, promotion, and configuration integrations for Artifactory are built on top of this client. So this is sort of the base of everything. Um, it exposes the Artifactory REST API, API in a pure Ruby interface. It's very lightweight. All the depths come from the Ruby standard lib. Um, one of the nice things it does is it smooths over a bunch of the rough edges in the Artifactory REST API and actually exposes new resources that don't exist in the Artifactory REST API. So the client has resources for managing repo layouts, backups, LDAP settings, SNTP settings, base URL. And this is all stuff that lives in the main, if you ever look at the REST API, uh, at the systems configuration resource. So we can actually modify things that are down in that XML as individual resources. Um, as I mentioned, it's used as underpinning for all Chef's Ruby-based Artifactory integrations, and it also is open source, and it's available there. And I'll show a quick example. As I mentioned, it's mainly used as a low-level primitive, um, but it's still interesting to see how you could use an IRB or PRI. You could do querying with it and stuff, so we're gonna do a quick, quick walkthrough here. Uh, so in this, we're gonna try to query for the latest stable version of Chef Server on the Ubuntu 10.04 platform and version, right? So instantiate the client, 
Uh, one of the things you give it in its config is the endpoint. Um, as many of you already know, most artifactory searches are actually composed of two different queries. Uh, first, we need to locate the latest stable version of the, sh the Chef Server product project, and once we have a reference to that exact version number, we can turn around and perform a property search and uh, you know, locate an exact artifact. So first thing we're doing here is we're going to get the, the latest release version. You can see we give it a repo, the group, the name. Um, and then after that, we can turn around and take that latest stable version reference we got, do another query, um, and do some filtering with those properties, which we're going to talk about where those properties come from in a second. Um, and after you get that reference back, you can do things like print out the URI, check some, or all of the artifacts properties. And it's not just for reading. You can actually perform uploads and modify configurations. So there's a bunch of other stuff you can do with a client. And this is where we add new functionality. So if Artifactory brings out something new in the API, we'll go here first, add functionality, test, make sure it's up to date. Um, cool. So now we're going to zoom in a little bit on that bottom arrow. Uh, talk about how we shuttle artifacts from our CI systems over into Artifactory. Um, so we've written a publisher, we call it, that's part of the Omnibus framework. And this is used for uploading Omnibus artifacts into Artifactory Pro instances. It writes the artifacts to a path that adheres to that custom repo layout we talked about. Uh, and it converts all that Omnibus metadata information we talked about early into Artifactory artifact properties. So it can also be used via command line or Ruby. Um, and it's open source and ships as part of the Omnibus framework, so at the URL we talked about before. So again, going back to this, the output of a build, uh, the publisher makes an assumption that the metadata JSON file lives alongside the package, um, and it exists in the same directory as the artifact to be published. And we end up calling that just same command line interface. You can see we call omnibus publish artifactory, and then we give a repo name and a path to the artifact. Um, the actual instance endpoint credentials that we're going to publish to are part of the uh, omnibus config file, which is just loaded by default. So here's some of the output. Uh, you can see it loaded the config file, and it started the, the publishing, and did the upload. Nothing too exciting there. Um, it gets more exciting because it's glob aware, so you can upload multiple packages at once. So in this example, this would upload any artifact in the PKG directory and its subdirectories and anything that ends in an extension that Omnibus supports, right? So you can see BFF, Deb, MSI, all the different ones there. So if you had a whole bunch of things, the output of a Jenkins build, you could just throw it at that with the right glob and everything's going to upload, so. Um, and you can also perform that same upload using pure Ruby. This saves an unnecessary shell out if the tool that's going to be calling the publisher is Ruby. Uh, and here at Chef, that's actually how we how we do things. So every, all our integrations and our CI stuff is pure Ruby, so it's just calling the actual classes. Um, another interesting thing in the Ruby version is the publisher.publish uh, method actually yields to a block, so you can do things like uh, print log message during a multi-artifact upload, right? Yeah. Um, I'll talk more about in a second. You could, yes, you definitely could do filtering based on that to get the exact platform and stuff. So, um, so for example, if you upload a dab, it actually knows how it exists. Yep, yeah, based on that, that layout. Um, so again, here we are. The, you know, we talked about that JSON and where do those omnibus properties and artifactory come from. You can see here I've, I've laid the metadata JSON on the top there and the actual like what gets dumped into Artifactory in the bottom, and you can see the mapping there. So the arc, arc key in the metadata gets turned into Omnibus Architecture. There's an iteration. Um, all of those checksums are dumped in. Uh, the platform version, the platform. Um, you know, and this stuff's useful for, for querying at a later time or doing certain searches and things like that. So and it's also very important in our publishing uh, tasks out to the external system, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, awesome. So that's sort of how we think, get things into Artifactory. Uh, again, just using that publisher. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit of how we do promotions. Uh, so how do we move something from the current local repo up to the stable local? Uh, so we're going to talk about a Lita plugin we wrote for Artifactory. Um, first, for those that don't know what Lita is, so Lita is a chatbot written in Ruby. Plugins are Ruby gems. They're fully testable with RSpec. 
Um, and it works with most any chat service out there, including HipChat, Slack, IRC, Campfire. And it's also open source. You can check it out at that URL. So let's talk about how we did uploads in the past or promotions. So engineer would yell in the release channel that we need something promoted. Um, if one of us was around, we could get to it. Um, if not, they'd have to wait. The actual promotion was done via the web UI, which anybody that's done copying or moving things around in our factory probably recognizes that modal. Um, you know, it was bad because the release engineers became a bottleneck. There was no visibility into when the promotion was executed. So the new way we do things is actually, this is actually log, log output from one of our chat, some of our chat history. I'm gonna zoom in on that command in a second, but basically we just tell Julia to do the promotion. She outputs some data and the engineers are happy. So that's what the actual command looks like. So at Lita, Artifactory Promote, give a project like Chef Server version, let's say 1208, and then just the from and the to repo. And just does its thing. So the great thing about this plugin, like I said, anyone can promote a build. Um, promotions can be performed while on the go with any of your mobile chat clients. And all the promotions are recorded in chat history. Um, so this plugin is also open source and available at that URL. And it uses the Artifact Ruby client under the covers, like another one of those things that uses that, so. Awesome, uh, so let's talk next about how we actually get things out to our external systems a little bit. So we're gonna talk about the Artifactory user plugin for Package Cloud. So, you know, this Groovy script provides simple one-to-one -one mapping between Arti an Artifactory repo and the associated Package Cloud repo. It responds to all storage events. Uh, so the current state of the Artifactory repo is always in sync with the external system. So that's always got the latest from Artifactory takes advantage of the async HTTP builder, so package pushes actually occur in parallel. They don't block in the UI, which is nice. Um, and that script, I don't really have it in a separate repo, so I pulled it out of our config management stuff and actually threw it on just for y'all. I think we're just gonna create a repo just for these plugins, but you can get it there right now, at least if you wanna see the source later. Um, and I'm not gonna show all the source here, but I, I wanted to show how we configure it and how it's wired into the publish lifecycle, okay? So, um, so all configs kept in a simple JSON file, which is managed by Chef. Uh, the create, copy, and move events are actually all called a shared, a shared function to push things up to Package Cloud, and then uh, the, the delete event yanks things back out of Package Clouds, right? So if we do delete something in Artifactory, it's pulled out of the external system. Uh, you know, config's pretty easy. Got the user token, uh, which is required to communicate with Package Cloud's API. Um, there's a simple one-to-one -one mapping between a local Artifactory repo and the external repo on, on Package Cloud. So you can see here, we've got the Omnibus current local repo mapping out to current, and the stable local mapping to stable. And the other thing that's really cool is it's got this idea of an exclusion filter, which is simple regex that are basically packages that you do not want to publish out to the external system. So the exclusion filter you guys see there is actually the one we used uh, we wanted to prevent publishing of artifacts for the delivery project before we had publicly announced it at ChefComp. So we had to hold back from getting that in the external system, but the team still wanted to use obviously the same published lifecycle for artifactory and everything else. And this is something you're just gonna have to look at later. I apologize for log output, doesn't come out, we're good. But what I wanna show you guys here is um, the series of begin log messages that are all within a millisecond of each other. So, right, so that shows the threading that happens with the async HTTP filter. So, there's five packages being published externally. They all spawn a message right away. Um, within a few milliseconds, uh, the, com the copy completes internally in Artifactory. And then about five minutes later, all of those threads that were spawned actually print a complete message. Um, packages that we were uploading were about uh, 500 megs, so it takes a little while to get them out to the external system. But sort of shows that, that threading and stuff and how that works, which is cool. Awesome, so let's chat a little bit about managing Artifactory Pro with Chef. So obviously, we love Chef, so we, we, we wrote a cookbook to help do that. Um, so this, we've got an Artifactory Pro cookbook, which supports installation upgrades of Artifactory Pro. It includes primitive resources for managing a bunch of its configuration in idempotent way. And this will be open source soon. We didn't have it fully ready to go, but I'm planning on getting this out in the next few weeks. So 
But if anybody wants access to it early, just tell me and I'll add you guys to the repo and you can see it early. So, um, so we're going to walk through some of the primitive resources. So uh, even if you don't know Chef or Ruby, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to tell what's happening here. So we're going to walk through, just show some of the things. Um, so in this example, we're going to manage a group and some of the permissions, uh, a permission target for that group. So, you know, we create a group for the deployers, um, and we want to apply the permission target of a deploy to that group. One thing to notice about this permission target is we've got, uh, it's got the deploy, annotate, and read uh, rights, but it doesn't have the delete rights. So the reason we have that is we don't want an artifact to get overwritten if the CI system tries to republish something that's already out there. So we'd actually rather have uh, those systems that are publishing into Artifactory fail and uh, the upload then destructively overwrite something. So yeah, that's it. So there's a group we create. Down here you see the groups. We actually apply those permissions to that group at that target. Um, user creation. So we've got an Artifactory user, Alton Brown. Uh, he's an admin. Here's the Jenkins user I was sort of talking about that publishes in right now. We make sure they're not an admin and they're part of that deployers group. Um, pretty simple. Uh, but since Chef's just Ruby, we can take advantage of a couple Ruby things. So it'd be much better to actually get a list of the users for an external system. So the encrypted data bag item for environment helper actually just pulls our arbitrary encrypted data from a Chef data bag item. But you could also pull that data from something like HashiCorp's vault, something like that. Um, but the point is, you get that list of users. You use the enumerables.each method. You can actually iterate over those, yield the username, the user data. So that's a key in the value from that hash, and actually create a user for each of the, the uh, users in that hash. So just show some other ways to do that. Um, create the layout and the repos associated with that layout. So remember, we went back and we had that custom layout. Nice long regex, but you can see up there, there's the layout creation. Um, it's got the folder integration revisions, file integration revision regex. And then we actually create the two repos we've been talking about, Omnibus Current Local, Omnibus Stable Local, and we apply that uh, layout to those. Um, backups. This shows creation of a, a daily backup and a weekly backup. So in this case, directory where we want to do the backup to. Um, top one actually runs Monday through Friday at 2 AM. Bottom one for the weekly backup runs Saturday at 2 AM. So pretty simple stuff. Uh, SMTP credentials. So we use Google Apps. That shows how to configure uh, to talk to the, Google, the Gmail SMTP server then. Uh, and there's an artifactory user that sends messages out. LDAP. Uh, we authenticate our instance with LDAP. So that shows a rough example of how you might do that. Cool. So. Some things we have upcoming roadmap-wise that we want to do. Um, I really want to teach the Ruby client, the Omnibus Publisher, and the Lita plugin how to use the build resource. I'd actually like to have the Omnibus build map to an artifactory build, right? So we could actually promote that whole build versus copying a set of artifacts around. Um, be really nice. We want to add uh, AQL support to the Ruby client for doing better queries. And for the Lita plugin, we're going to be adding some search command stuff. So really think about things like I want to know the latest current version or latest stable version of a project, stuff like that. And that's it. So questions? <laughs> Which one, the AQL or? He, he asked how soon is soon. Oh, the cookbook? Um, like I said, if anybody wants to get access to it now, I'll just add you to the repo, even though it's private. Mainly, it hasn't been open source because of the load related to when Chef open sources a cookbook. We get a lot of people coming in to make changes, and, and it's great. It's just right now I didn't have the, the, the time to support that. So, But if there is anybody here that wants to get access, just tell me afterwards. Do you have uh, drink tokens even for questions? or? I do. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, so uh, you have the package cloud being part of your external uh, uh, source for binaries, right? Any compelling reason not to use Artifactory externally? Um, mainly, we didn't want to deal with like possibly having to secure that and scale that and a lot of that stuff at the time. So we decided to use an external service that would basically handle that for us. Um, we're also friends with those guys, so we were sort of using their product and dogfooding it with them. So there was just that too, trying it out and. 
So we, you know, we've thought about possibly moving things to Bintray at some point as the external publishing point, but right now Package Cloud's been working, and so. Okay, the other, other question was, you have your own, uh, you know, the MD5, the SHA-512, mm -hmm. and SHA-256 uh, mm -hmm. for, you know, trying. So it's, 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 uh, it's possible to search for an artifact, free, uh, artifact in an yep, artifact using by check MD5. Uh, I've tried MD5, but with SHA-256 and Fightful, is there a dip in the performance or? Yeah, I mean, the larger ones take longer to compute, obviously. Now we do, just so you're aware, when you do an upload with that publisher, we do set the SHA-256 and the MD5 in Artifactory's native spots. So when we do the upload, we set the MD5 and the SHA-256 in the header, so that when the upload happens, for those that don't know via the API, if you set those in the header, Artifactory actually uses those in a comparison after the artifact's received. So it recomputes the checksums of the artifact, and if they don't match, it actually will throw like a, I think it's a 409, and okay. fail the upload. So, so the nice thing too, and like if you go and look in the UI, it'll say like uploaded, and it'll tell you if it's identical versus not, right? If you did provide them. So, yeah. So you could search by checksums, definitely, if you wanted. So your custom repo um, uses uh, path segments that have dots in them. Yes. And so has has there been any gotchas that you've noticed? working interop with other tools since obviously that's a package. Yeah, um, you know, we've been okay so far. Uh, mostly the tooling that's integrating with this uses our client, so we know, right? So, so the only things that are fetching out of there are, are tools that are doing querying. We do have a resource I didn't talk about called Omnibus Artifact, Ar Artifactory Artifact for fetching packages during a chef run and installing the package. So it just sort of does the search. It gives you some nice high-level attributes to say, what version you want of like chef server and it would actually use those properties under the covers to do the filtering and that kind of stuff. But we haven't had any issues yet. Um, we have had some issues with the auto cleanup on the current repo. That doesn't work all that well, but from talking to the JFrog guys, I think it's related to a custom layout in general that the snapshot cleanups mainly Maven uh, layout. So I'd like to get to the bottom of that, but the follow-up question is, we made a similar choice and we decided to, to substitute dot, underscores for dots, right? Okay. And so uh, what you know now, would you go back and do it the same way or would you? Yeah, I think we would just, yeah. it's worked so far. Yeah, we haven't had any issues, so. So is there any plan to extend the metadata JSON so that it matches up with the build info that's being generated by Java so that API build is a little more useful for the artifacts? So, so, that, you can, so that you can fully leverage all of the build yeah. searchability. So for us, since our artifacts are just, they're not even Java, like we don't even think that way. Like we do have Java in some of our applications, like Chef Server has solar, so, so there's, you know, JDK is packaged in. Um, our analytics product has Storm and some other things in it. But the actual artifact that's produced is so far from the Java world, like, and everything's baked in there at a certain version, including the JVM. Like, we don't worry too much about matching those up. Um, but if there are suggestions for that metadata, I mean, pretty much what we're doing right now is anything that metadata JSON file, we just turn around and translate directly into properties on the, on the artifact up in Artifactory, so we could definitely change that or add to that. Yeah, I think um, uh, the dependency tree would be the most interesting yep. bit, because then you'd be able to leverage that out of the API. Yeah, there, there's actually, um, Omnibus the framework just had a couple enhancements made by one of our engineers with this idea of a version manifest. So that, that's a JSON file that represents you know, all the dependencies and all the transitive dependencies, and it shows you everything in a JSON structure. And you can do diffing with that. So you can do neat things like based on like 1200 of Chef Server versus 1230, what changed. And you can see that. And we're going to use that for automatic change log generation, a bunch of cool things. So we're looking at where that's going to go, like that JSON. But we've thought about actually storing it up in Artifactory just in a property on the artifact or maybe on the, on the folder for the version, right? And this is where if we got the build support in there, and actually supported the true build resource that Artifactory exposes, that's a great spot for that kind of stuff. So, um, got a bunch of stuff in play there. I, I don't know, they, I know they want it to work outside of Artifactory, so they've thought about maybe persisting that JSON into the tag 
for the build, right? So you could do diffing out of there. So it's a bunch of things. I think we'll end up probably supporting multiple ways. So people that aren't using Artifactory can still use that version manifest, but if you are using Artifactory, it would be available there for you. So, yeah. Anybody else? Hey, what's happening? Um, <clears throat> with your cookbook that you guys did, um, yep. did you? Uh, I, I'm sure you probably thought of it, but why did you not do the make having resource for a repo itself? Um, we we went through and did it, mm -hmm. or actually we didn't do it, but just from the fact that it would be nice. But then at other time, people go through the website and make changes, mm -hmm. so then you have two sources of truth, right? Going through the website or going through the cookbook. And so I'm interested in what you guys' thoughts were. Oh, yeah, we, we don't go through the website ever. Mm -hmm. Like, so the only people that can make changes are the release engineers, right? We manage that infrastructure like a service, and it's hands off, so it's chef only. Yeah. Same thing with our Jenkins. Jenkins jobs, everything are managed by chef, so there's no touching the, the UI, so. <laughs> but yeah, if, if you did get in the case where somebody modified in the UI, the next time chef runs, it's gonna put it back the way it should be, yeah. so. Right on. But, yep. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody. <laughs>